change this country. We can topsy turvy this country. You know that? Without shedding of blood, without killing anybody. It can be done. That's the destiny Allah is offering it to us. He said, Leave you the hero who Allah deen kulle. He's given you a deen. That's to master, overcome, and supersede them all. Bulldoze them all. Wallahu kadiha al mushrikun. Now, mind how the mushrik might not like it. This is the destiny of his deen. And he repeats it again. Another place in the Quran, same formula. Then he repeats again. He it is who has sent his messenger with guidance, al-haq, and with the religion of truth, that it may prevail, overcome, and supersede every other deen. Whether it be Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianism, Communism, Judaism, every ism, Islam is destined to master them all. Wakafa billahi shahida. And enough is Allah is a witness to this fact that He's going to make His deen to prevail. Auzu billahi min shaitanir rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Ya ayyuhal lazina amanu. Kunu awamin bil qist. Shuhada alillahi. Walau ala anfusikum. أبي الوالدين والأقربين أن يكون غنيا أو فقيرا والله أولى بهما صدق الله صدق الله المرة العظيم I quoted my dear brother I quoted to you an ayah from the Holy Quran from Surah Nisa Surah Nisa happens to be the fourth chapter ayah number 135 so in the ayah I read to you from Surah Nisa Ah, you find that. How do you find as a Surah Nisa? You found it. Another way of getting this ayah is an ayah talking about justice. So in this Quran, in this index and the J, look for justice. And there are seven different places where this word justice is mentioned. Justice. Allah is just. He wants you to be just. Seven different places. You can check them up. This one is Chapter 4, verse 135. Allah says, Ya Yuhallazina Manu. He's addressing those who believe, those who have people who have faith. Ya Yuhallazina Manu. Kunu Kawamina Bil Christ. So stand up firmly for justice. Wala wala anfusikum. Even if it goes against yourself. Here's a start. You know, we can't do justice. Look around you. Can we do justice? Are we doing justice? To our wives, our children, our neighbors, our brothers, in giving of the inheritance. Brother eats away the sister's inheritance. Because he says, look, if I give the inheritance, what is due to her, her husband will eat it up. So he, he, God, he eats it up. You know that? We don't give inheritance to our children, but what is due to our sisters, we don't give. To our daughters we don't give, the son-in-law will eat it up. Can you do justice? There's a conflict of interest. Now when you sit down and reason, and the man is reasoning with you, he said, look, we entered into a contract. Like this, like this, like that. And now according to that, I am entitled to 50%. But you know, it's going to go against you now. You know that is so. So he said, yes, but you see, you know, I used to work night time, little extra time. I used to do this and I used to do that, so I deserve a bigger share. But look, we had bargained 50-50. We were going to share equally. He said, yes. But you see, are you, can you do justice against yourself? If it goes against yourself, can you do say, yes, mm -hmm. no, brother, you are right. I owe you this. Let me give it to him. Can you do it? Very difficult. Very difficult because we are not trained for that. We are still animals. We want to grab, grab, grab. You don't want to give what is due to somebody else. We do, can't do justice because we are not programmed with justice. Anfusikum. Awil walidain. Or even if it goes against your parents, your father and your mother. You come home. Your mother is complaining. That guy next door. You know, our little hen, Murgi. It went into his yard and the guy hit it with a stone and broke the leg. Our hen, Murgi, Murgi, you know, poultry, he broke the leg. We are now worked up into a frenzy. You want to go and fight that fellow, no? Yes. 
your mother is crying about the chicken so you want to put up a fight you are not asking ma what was our fowl doing in the other neighbor's yard hmm? he says that person there he plants the bhaji coriander mint and our fowl goes and scratches it up is it right can you tell that to your ma <laughs> you are going to take her part your ma is crying you must go and fight for her a dispute between your father and somebody else you are going to take your father's side no you don't want to hear what is right and wrong your father is your father then you must take his side Allah says no 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 even if it goes against your father or your mother wal aqrabin or your relations so Allah says I want to protect people's interests that is a poor man let me take his side Allah says no you don't do that that's not your job protecting people's interests is not your job your job is to do justice that's what Allah says protecting people no no you listen and according to your God given insight sense of justice and fair play whatever is to be done you have to do you don't say I protect this fellow's interest because he's poor he's weak or I don't care this man is rich he can afford let him pay you don't do that now this justice are we capable of doing it the answer is no you know why because it needs a constant reminder and Allah is giving it to us in the Holy Quran you reading you bacha the Quran what are you bachaing there's instructions if you only understood what is Allah is telling you he's telling you he said, no man I must do justice mm -hmm. any cost I must do justice even if my son's head is involved it has to be chopped off he has been selling drugs my son he said, well, you know, you do this like that, you, know, you price this fellow and can get off. I said, mm -hmm. let him pay the price. Can I do that? The only time I can do that is, if I was constantly reminding myself, programming myself, brainwashing myself, I must do justice. I must do justice. Never mind if it's my son. And never mind if it's my father or my mother. Never mind if it's my wife. If I keep on telling myself, reminding myself, Allah's kalam, Wallah, you'll be able to do justice. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Just for reading, for recitation, beautiful. You know, when I get lawyers coming to my office, lawyers, I show them this beauty of the Quran. He will appreciate the man who is studying law. So I open the book for him. Anybody, anybody comes along, what's your profession? The guy says, he's a journalist. I say, look, I show you in the Quran, miracle of journalism. You are a lawyer, man doing justice. I said, look, look, look. Bring it here, Look what this book says about justice. Sit down, sit down. And I read this verse. There are so many verses. I read this verse. And the commentary. I said, chapter 4. I'm looking, chapter 4. Verse 135. I found it. I found it. Allah says, O you who believe, stand out firmly for justice as witnesses to God. Justice is Allah's attribute and when you stand up for it, you are standing for God. He gives you a commentary, this man, listen to his English. The substance of the message and the language that he is using. He says, justice is God's attributes. It's an attribute of God. Allah has got 99 names and one of these names is his Al-Haq. He is just. So justice is God's attribute. And to stand firm for justice is to be a witness to God. It is to witness to Allah. You stand for justice is standing for Allah. Even if it is detrimental to our own interests. As we perceive it. We think is going against our interest. Wallah it's not. You do justice and you feel hurt that I have to now shell out hundred runs, thousand runs has to go. You think it's going against your interest, self-interest. As you see it, Allah says no. As you see it, but it's not going against your interest. It will be in your interest to do justice. How Allah rewards you, 
in many different ways for you having done justice, what benefits you're going to get in the future? That you are a man who can stand up for justice. You find the whole world will come to your door. Like our Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wasallam, you know, even before Nubuwa, the title that they gave him, As-Sadiqul Wa'adul Ameen. If you go for Hajj, those of you who have been for Hajj, you go to Medina, the tomb of our Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and there are grooves, metal grooves, on which are inscribed La ilaha illallah al malikul haqqul mubeen Muhammadur Rasulullah al sadiqul wadul ameen Again, ten times this verse is repeated there. Ten times. Or is it fifteen? I have the picture of that in my office. I counted it about ten or fifteen. There are three grills, five, five, five. La ilaha illallah al malikul haqqul mubeen Muhammadur Rasulullah As-Sadiqul Wa'adul Ameen As-Sadiqul Wa'adul Ameen is not from the Quran This is the tribute that the Mushriks of Makkah paid to him is As-Sadiqul Wa'ad a man who fulfills his promises Al-Ameen the truthful, the faithful, the trustworthy just, the man is just even if it goes against our own interests as we conceive them or the interest of those who are near and dear to us according to the Latin saying let justice be done though heaven should fall but Islamic justice is something higher than the formal justice of the Roman law or any other human law it is even more penetrative than the subtler justice in the speculation of the Greek philosophers it searches out the innermost motives because we are to act as in the presence of Allah as if Allah is present he's a witness he knows what is in your heart and mind now you open your mouth you're thinking that Allah is listening he knows what is going through your heart and mind it searches out the innermost motives because we are to act as in the presence of Allah to whom all things acts and motives are known he continues on what I've already said he says some people may be inclined to favor the rich because they expect something from them some people may be inclined to favor the poor because they are generally helpless so these are your considerations the man is helpless help him the guy is rich so my butter is buttered that side bread is buttered that side because they are generally rich partiality in either case is wrong be just without fear or favor both the rich and the poor under God's protection as far as the legitimate interests are concerned but they cannot expect to be favored at the expense of others and he Allah can protect their interests far better than any man all this you're getting in this book language philosophy language philosophy right guidance understanding when you read this and you talk about this it changes your life it must change your life that's the purpose of the book is to change our lives but we read it for sawab, for blessings, and I believe, wallah, I believe that Allah will give you sawab. But you see, we are bargaining with Allah, very cheap. You are getting something in return, very cheap. You are bargaining for 10 to 1. When you can get million to 1. Do business with him, million to 1. Be hisab, without account. <laughs> you can do business with him no counts how you read with understanding and that motivates you into action a million for reward do that type of business you don't have to keep count he is a good accountant he's got his accountants with us but we say he is the most perfect accountant nothing can go wrong your niya is right is getting credited getting credited on the day of judgment you will get everything more than what you deserve a hundredfold reward a thousandfold reward a millionfold reward for all the little things that we have been doing our salat our zakat our hajj our song for everything more than what you deserve <coughs> and when everything is given to you eh, mountain size blessings 
than another Himalayan, like the Himalaya, another heap of blessings. <laughs> see, Abhayatana, what is this for now? <laughs> Look, I can see, all right, I have been praying, you know, not too good. My mind was not always there, but uh, I'm, I'm grateful that you accepted all my, those weak salats of ours. What is this, really? Our fasting, what is it, really? Our zakat, our hajj, what is it, really? Really speaking, according to his absolute standard, what are they? Nothing, Allah, nothing. They are acts. We are just putting up acts. Good acts. Allah accepts. He knows that we are weak. He accepts. But for that, He has given you a million fold reward for that. And now another Himalayan heap of blessings. See, what is this for now? So these are for your good intentions. Can you imagine? Your good intentions. A man came to you. He said, you know, we're putting up a masjid. I need some help. Please help us. Mm -hmm. How much? What do you need? He says, you know, we need another 50,000 rands to complete the job. It hurts you. He says, man, this work, work is worth assisting. If Allah had given me that 50,000 rands, I wouldn't allow this man to go around begging. That's all. You got only five runs or fifty runs you can spare. You give it to him. Sincere you believe so. All that is getting credit to your account. Believe me, Allah, this is Islam. The very thoughts going through your mind, sincerely you had no money. You are not thinking, well, if I just talk like this, I'm gonna get a million fold. Mm -hmm. you, you, you feel in your heart that if Allah had given it to me, I would have done this. He's printing hundred thousand Qurans. What will it cost? This is going to cost him two million. This is going to be quite a struggle. I said, yes. If I had the two million, I would tell him, I said, go, print the hundred thousand and take the money from me. Tell the guy to send me the account. That's all. You have not given a cent. But you sincerely feel that way. You got a reward for that hundred thousand Qurans. I'm very, very grateful for this opportunity of coming and sharing these thoughts. It was justice and equality. I could have turned it into justice and race. You know, standards of judging. But it goes on. It, and it goes on. I would rather that if you have any questions, any question regarding the thing that I have spoken or things other than that, you know, where a Christian missionary was harassing you about something, you did give an answer, the best answer that you had, the best response that you could, but you felt that it was not good enough. Said, uncle, how would you have handled this? In other words, I share with you. Maybe your answer was better than anything that I can imagine for myself. I will be learning from you. But, he said, uncle, how would you have answered this? Uncle, how would you have de dealt with this? So in other words, now I'm sharing with you that you in turn can use it, get better armed. So if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer those questions of yours. We can have half an hour given to question time. Can we have some questions from my brothers? We must learn to open our mouths. See, because otherwise we are terrified. The knowledge is there, but if you can't open your mouth, nobody knows. You have to learn to open your mouth. Speak! We have stopped speaking. You know, talking about deen, sharing deen. So easy, Wallah, it's so easy. Yesterday was July handicap. No? I'm sure your neighbors, non-Muslim, must have asked you, which horse you backing? Then, opportunity. Wallah, the opportunities, they are bound to preach Islam. The man is asking you, which horse did you back? This is your favorite. She said, no, we are Muslims, you see. We in Islam, we are told, we are not to gamble. Not one cent. Said, no, not one cent. So you can't take a chance, even once a year, you know, one run. Said, no, not even that. We have a sure winner, we back with him, we bet with him, sure winner, and he's telling us, The similitude, the example of him who spends his substance in the way of Allah, is that of a grain of corn, you plant, you get seven cobs. And fi kulli sumbulatim and everyone a hundred grains. Look, seven hundred to one. No bookie gives you that. That odds. You know that? No bookie. 700 to 1. And it doesn't stop even there. Allah doesn't stop with 700 to 1. 
So Allah Yudai Fulliman Yasha, Wallahu Wasun Alim. And he gives many full increases to whom he pleases. He can reward you a million for. I do my betting with him in his way. I give, I spend, and I know I'm a sure winner. So any excuse how you get started. That's your job. That's our job, the job of the Muslim. This is a perpetual job, it's not a job for the professionals. Ahmad Didad must do the job. Sheikh Najjar must do the job. Sheikh Nazim must do the job. What's wrong with you? No, but Allah won't ask you. Why didn't you preach like Ahmad Didat? Why didn't you argue and debate like Ahmad Didat? He won't ask you that. He'll only ask you, you, according to your capacity, your understanding, did you do the job? And if we can say, Ya Bari Tala, to the best of my ability, I tried. It's good enough. Well, it's good enough. He won't ask you, why didn't you do like Didat? Why didn't you compete with Didat? No. You, according to what you know, did you? So, come, my dear brother, anything that you want to know, don't be shy. Come forward, I'm your brother, elder brother. You share with me, I share with you. Yes, brother. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. You see, my brethren, I keep on telling wherever I go in the world, I am a specialist. You know what's a specialist? The man who specializes. Right? When you are sick, you go to the general practitioner. And he sees something, so it's beyond his grasp, your sickness. Then he, he thinks, man, this guy's got some snick, uh, skin sickness. He sends you to a skin specialist. This guy, I think he's got some cancerous growth. He said, now you go along for some way and you have this thing done and you know. Specialist. This is the world of specialization. Now you go to the specialist and you ask for some simple problem. He said, look, go and see a general practitioner. This is the world of specialization. I have specialized in dealing with the Jew, dealing with the Christian, dealing with the Hindu, dealing with the atheist, the agnostic, the guy who said there is no God. That's my field. Now when you ask a man something regarding his field, he feels happy and proud to share it with you. Because now he's shining. You see, he's brilliant. You ask him some way about which he's going to fumble now. You know, actually what you do is you degrade him. Because now I have to come down and apologize. I said, look brother, you say, look man, this is something beyond my understanding. I don't understand. I don't know how to solve your problem. You have to go to your sheikhs and imams. And the best way to me, this problem, look, I don't know. I was telling somebody, might be cynical. I said, you know, where are the giants of these two sides? There must be two leaders. One says this, one says that. I said, you know what we should do? Lock them in a room. These two guys. And said, you fight it out. Either with your mind or with your fists. And the guy who comes out alive will follow him. <laughs> Look, no more, wallah, no problems whatsoever. If you do that, but nobody will listen to me. <laughs> this is my philosophy. I said, Look, lock them up in a room, the giants of the both sides. Whoever these controversialists are, lock them in a room. He said, now look, you guys, you fight it out. You come to some agreement, or you fight it out, with tooth and nail, and the guy who comes out alive will follow him. <laughs> Wallah, they won't have any conflict. No brother, this is beyond my capacity. This is for the alims, the learned men, the must. Because if I start putting my nose into everything, the job that I'm doing, I'm involved in. Nobody is doing that. Nobody is doing what I'm doing. Am I right or am I wrong? Now I'll be taken off. Now I'm fighting everybody because now here, 50-50, I'm sure. 50-50. If I say this guy is right, 50% my enemies. If I say this side is right, that's 50% of my... What am I doing? I want you all to help me at the Good Hope Center tomorrow. Not to now... I can't. I haven't got the wisdom of Solomon. No, Solomon alayhi salam. He was very wise. I am no Solomon. Just one like you. I said, leave me in peace in the work that I am doing. In that work, bring me problems because you're doing me a favor if I haven't got the answer you're doing me a favor I don't like it that I confess look I haven't got the answer for that that this Jew said you this and mm, I don't know what to say this Christian said why are you circumcised 
What's all this? What do you want to do? You think Allah needs that? Come to me. Talk to me. I give you. If I can't, I feel ashamed of myself. I will find the answer. Not today. Tomorrow. I'll find the answer. Help some other people somewhere else. So you are doing me a favor. Making me to think. But these problems, brother, are <laughs> beyond me. Forgive me. Yes, brothers. Brother yes, brother. Uh, I saw in last night's I think uh, newspaper uh, regarding the uh, a statement the, that uh, Brother Dida speaks about uh, the problems of South Africa uh, generally uh, in, uh, uh, with the uh, race problem and Islam to solve the problem. How yes. does Brother Dida see that? That's correct. You see, I think I had made a statement that the the proper solution to the problems of South Africa, this racial problem, only Islam can solve. Everybody must become Muslim. I know it sounds like a far-fetched thing. Imagine, you know, you say this guy is, you know, daydreaming or what. But Allah is telling you in the Quran, He has given you a deen, a way of life. He said, Li yuzihira hu ala deen kulli. A deen, a way of life that is to master, overcome and supersede them all. Bulldoze them all. And I believe that. Allah tells me that and Islam gives you the solution. There is a problem of race in this country. Biggest problem. You know racism. We are all racist, you know that. To some degree. We might not be as bad as a white man, but we can't say we are free from that sickness. Nobody can say. The Malay, you know he feels he's better than the colored, no? Yes. Don't lie. The, the Kokni feels he's better than the Malay, no? In your heart and mind. Maybe we don't say so. <laughs> this is the nature of man. All of us are like that. We are all sick. We are all sick. Some more sick than the other. Solution. Allah gives it to us in the Quran. We make able, everybody to accept that. And we program ourselves with that. That sickness will decrease. Allah says, Ya Yohannas, O mankind, Inna khalakna kum min zakarim wa unsa. So most certainly, we have created you all from a single pair of a male and a female. Wa ja'alna kum shu'uban wa qabaila. And it is we who have made you into nations and tribes. What for? To discriminate against one another? No. He says, Allah says, لِتَعَارَفُوا That you may recognize one another. These are convenient labels. This Ahmad is a Kokani, this Ahmad is a Malay, this Ahmad is a Surti, this Ahmad is a Nigerian, this Ahmad is a Zulu, this Ahmad is a Khaza, this is Ahmad is a Bura. <laughs> now these are convenient labels, so we can recognize, look, your forefathers invented it, the Malay. These surnames you carry, how did you carry? Same! For identity. You see, the white man enslaving your great grandfathers, brought them from Indonesia, from Malaysia, you can't even practice, you can't even pray like this. So you have to do things in secret, in hiding. This man's house, that man's place, that farm, that day, you have to run around like wild bucks. That's how you did it. But when you meet in, that, in those conditions, to bacha the Quran, Yasin Sharif, Allah's names, you want to know who's who? I say, ah, what's your name? I say, Yusuf. And you? I say, Ibrahim. You? Dawood. You? Muhammad. You? Yusuf. You? Muhammad. You? Dawood. Right, but how do you know who's who now? We're talking about this Yusuf. So which Yusuf? You know, I said that Yusuf. is a which one? He's a guy who works for Fenter, man. So he becomes Yusuf Fenter. <laughs> that Muhammad... He works for Hendrix, you know, Hendrix has enslaved him. There's Muhammad Hendrix. Can you see that? For identity. Now we have to give Yusuf, 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 how many Yusufs? We had to give the identity, we said, look, this is Yusuf Hendrix, this is Yusuf, um, and this is Johnson. You know, Yusuf Johnson, and this is Yusuf. So that is how convenient labels you created for yourselves to recognize one another. Allah Bari Ta'ala on a global scale, He created convenient labels, different, different people, so we can recognize them. But we all have a sickness. Who is better among the lot now? I say we. My nation. You know my nation. I'm a Surti. 
We say we are the Aryans, the master race. We conquered India 5,000 years ago, my forefathers. My nation belongs to that Moraji Desai, the guy who is ruling India, Prime Minister. <laughs> Nehru's nation, that's my nation. If I was not a Muslim, I'll be boasting. I'm an Aryan, Arya. So the sickness is there. For 5,000 years, the thing is there. We are being programmed. 5,000 years, the same sickness. We are better than the other fellow. In my village, our villagers, every villager feels he's better than the other villager. There's a river in between. I won't give my daughter to the guy on the other side because that's like a foreign country. On the other side of the river. Salt, salt river. One side is another nation. Another side is another nation of Malays. Can you imagine? This guy on the west side, he won't give his daughter to the guy on the east side. That's how we were in India. So this is there. Everybody feels. The German feels he is topmost. The Englishman feels he is topmost. The Buddha feels he is the topmost. Everybody feels he is the topmost. You know that? This is the sickness of man. This is how man feels. It gives him happiness. Consolation. So what are you going to do about that sickness? So Allah is telling you. He says, no, no, no. These are all false standards. Standard acceptable in his sight? He says, inna akramakum, inna Allahi atkakum. Most certainly, the noblest in Allah's sight is he who is the best in conduct. Not black or white. Not Kokni or Malay. Not Arab or Ajam the best in conduct. So this is the only standard. He says don't drink. No, it doesn't say you Indian Muslim mustn't drink. No. He says the whole of humanity. Don't touch that abomination. It's an abomination of Satan's handiwork. Don't gamble. It doesn't say the Muslim mustn't gamble, the others must. He says no, no, no. no. Nobody. People don't gamble. So in other words a happier community. No drinking, no gambling, no fortune telling, no idol worship. So. Islam has a solution to the problem of race. Nobody has it. No other nation, no other system has the problem of race. Islam has the solution. So I said, look, accept Islam. In Medina, before our Nabi Karim sallam, he said his sacred feet, they were the Aus and the Hajraj, two tribes. And these tribes were on the verge of exterminating one another. Fighting, fighting, fighting over little, little things, killing one another. They are all Arabs, they are all Quraysh. But they are two different tribes. They are killing one another. Until our Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said his sacred feet in Medina and he offered them, Hablillah, the rope of Allah. Allah says, Wa'atasimu bi hablillahi jamiyun wa la tafarraku. Hold fast to the rope of Allah. What is this rope? You see from dangling from heaven? No. Allah's kalam. The Holy Quran, that's the rope. Allah wants you to hold on to. Once you all, downing humanity, all of us, when you hold to that, that becomes your common denominator, and your mutual support will save you all. Go to the book. We are not going to the book. All of us. We are not going to the book. The book of Allah. Who are we going to? To our leaders. We have our heroes. You know that? My heroes are from Jalalabad. So what that guy says, I accept. The guy from Rawal Pindi, what he knows about Islam. The guy from Al-Azhar, what he knows about Islam. The guy who comes from Kolivar from Al-Azhar, he said, this Hindi fellow, what does he know about Islam? This is the sickness. We got our own heroes. We are hero worshippers. We are not worshipping Allah, we are worshipping our heroes. Therefore, that strife, this, all this problem is hero worshipping. You go to Allah's Kalam, sincerely, all together, say, look, let's see what Allah says. And wallah, you'll find the answers there. And even if you make a mistake, Allah will reward you. Two rewards. Or one reward. You make a mistake sincerely. You go to the Quran and you misunderstood and you applied it. Not for mischief making, but you un misunderstood, you applied it, Allah will give you one reward for that. If you applied it right, He'll give you ten. There's no punishment. On the day of judgment, they say, look, you know, did that. <laughs> you had it all wrong, man. <laughs> my, my Lord he says, look, I didn't know. He said, what was it? He said, no, it was like this. Not the way you understood. Wallah, no punishment. If mischief was not your intention. But I want to create mischief. I want to create division. I want to create people to follow me. Against the other fellow. How can I create strife? That people have to now take sides. That is shaitani. Satanic. Devilish. We will be punished for it. Forget the heroes. 
go to Allah's kalam. It becomes a common denominator. Then we can talk. So what does Allah say on this subject? What does Allah say? Let's have a look. Is there an ayah about this in the Quran? Allah says, yes, says, let's have a look. And Allah has given you intelligence. You read it, He says, no man, it makes sense. This is the answer. What do we do with Rushdi? Go to the Quran. Allah tells you what to do. But no, no, I have my heroes. Shall I follow this fellow or that fellow? If it appears that I'm following that guy, then he's, he's the enemy of my hero. So I can't agree with him. I must agree with my hero. What does he say? Now that means you have to go on the day of judgment. Allah will put us with our heroes. If he goes to hell, you'll have to go to hell with him. No. Here the answer is there. The solution to our problems is here in Allah's kalam. Wallah. And there is nothing wet or dry that is not in the book of God. Allah says. Everything that you want, that you need is all there. But you don't know the book. I'm asking people. I delivered a lecture. That do you know that crucifixion is in the Quran? I said, come on, put up your hands. How many of you know? That means you know from, from, from reading the Quran that crucifying a person, if the person has done certain mischievous things, that person can be crucified. Very horrible death. You know, like they say what they did to Jesus. We can do to anybody. For certain mischievous behavior, beliefs, we can crucify the man. Ahmad Didat or Saleh Muhammad or whoever for certain crimes the guy deserves to be crucified if we had the power and the rule we say Allah says so this guy deserves to be crucified I say how many of you know that in the Quran this is the type of punishment that you can meet out to certain types of people who commit certain sins crimes please put up your hands you know there was only one person only one person is a whole huge audience in the masjid only one person he said he knew that such a thing is in the Quran can you imagine and we are Muslims we are prepared to die for Allah die for the Quran no, so what do you know about the Quran therefore I said look my brothers it's necessary get the book man today there's not another nation on earth which is as fortunate as you there isn't that they can buy a Quran if I tell the Americans, you know, it's less than two dollars each. So what? To print fifty thousand in France to send them to America, fifty thousand it cost me five dollars thirty-five cents. Fifty thousand. You know, I had them printed to send them to America. How much they're selling? They're selling for five. Then I'm telling them, I said, look, these black Muslims. And that's how you call Afro-American Muslims, the new converts. I said, look, if they are prepared to buy a thousand at a time, give them for three dollars. Costing me five thirty-five, sending across the Atlantic, sell them for three dollars. Tell them that the guy who goes and sells, he makes a dollar and you make a dollar. <laughs> look, I want people to have this book. This book is going to save us. This Allah is telling you, hold fast to Allah's rope. But we haven't got the rope. We haven't got it. We bacha the Quran. We listen to our qaris. We go into ecstasy and we exclaim Allahu Akbar. I say, what is Allahu Akbar for? It's not the message. It's the music. It's the music, the rhythm, the breath control. No? What are you shouting Allahu Akbar for? Tell me. The message? No. It's not the message that tickled you or me. It's the music of the Quran. It moves men to ecstasy and tears, even non-Muslims. A.J. Arbery, a Christian, he translates the Quran into English as a Christian. He says, whenever I hear the Quran chanted, you know the beautifully the way we read it, like this morning, there was a wedding here, beautiful recitation. By a brother called Abdul Rahman. Abdul Rahman, what's his name? Sardin. Abdul Rahman Sardin. While I was listening to him, I was feeling jealous. I was feeling jealous. I said, this fellow Saleh Muhammad, why didn't he ask this fellow to read tomorrow night in the Good Hope Center? Then after everything was over, I'm asking him, who's that fellow? He said, this is the fellow who will read tomorrow night, I said, Alhamdulillah. Beautiful, Allah, beautiful recitation. We hope he'll be reading tomorrow night. He won the second prize in the world contest among the Qadis. And that to me means nothing. Second and first, there's no real difference. 
because people when they choose between second first and second they can't really make up the, up the minds you can't they're so close so then our prejudice comes in I said look this guy here you know he's a poor guy from Africa you know if you give him the first prize he'll do him a lot more good than that guy coming from South Africa the South Africans are well to do people very nice you know so I said look I'll give it to this fellow you know that we can't, do, we can't be absolute just Allah won't question about that it's too too delicate that's too delicate now that type of justice you see you you have a tendency to uh, help us and okay, it'll help this fellow man Salih's son and some poor man's son I said Salih's son gets a thousand dollars I what is it to him you know I says look he's good this is good I said no we give it to the other fellow the, all the judges you know we are human mind after all I, I, I don't think Allah will question us about that it's too fine it's too fine it's very difficult justice can you see how difficult it is but this is what we are going to do but don't do injustice to people however so I have drifted off the, the race problem yes I mean, so that is yes so Islam has the answer that can bring the black and the white together the Muslim mal, mal, colored and the Christian colored together the Indians Hindus Muslim Christian all only Islam can bring them together the Jews and the Christian and the Muslims only Islam can bring them together so I said this is the only solution to the racial problem of South Africa come and talk to me have you got another solution bring it we want to hear what have you got we know the mess you have made already <laughs> this is so that was it my son somebody asked here this is it I say Islam has the answer to. The... but then the Muslim fellow jumps in you know that the Muslim jumps into the newspaper trying to ridicule I say you Muslim and you're a Maulana you know means a Shaykh you you doubt what I'm telling you are a Muslim look let the Hindu come forward fighting me let the Christian come forward let the Jew come forward let the Buddha come forward no it's a Muslim shaitan who comes forward to fight me you know that where, where is hurting you why should you come to fight me now ridicule me for what I'm telling you but now sickness sickness you see that Didat fellow is going to get in name Didat says this now you must contradict Didat yes my brothers yes Didat Mr. last night like that we can buy the Quran and give it to our Christian brothers yes uh, according to what we know and we practice that we must have a we must have a we must have a do do a Yes. How do we give it to them? Right. I will answer that. Uh, the question is, those of you who haven't heard, you see, the idea is that we ourselves, we do not hold the Quran without wudu. We must be in a state of taharat. Maybe a married man, you had sex with your wife. Next morning, or after that, you can't hold the Quran. You must have a complete bath. These are our regulations we must uphold them then what about the non-muslim how can you give him when he doesn't wash his backside <laughs> no look the objection sounds on the very valid Allah tells us in the Quran la yamassuhu illal mutahharoon so none shall touch it except those that are pure when we are not in a state of purity and when we can't touch it that guy is he pure he's not how can he touch it I said look your reasoning is very good but there are two standards of judging one is you and I are bound by a constitution you have to follow that constitution the other guy is outside that constitution until you have him converted as soon as he is converted he also has to follow that constitution but while he is outside his intention his niya gives him the purity of receiving it and this is not I'm trying to sell I am to do business therefore I'm trying to do this do business because with every Quran you buying I'm giving you 15 rands Allah 15 rands that means but I'll kiss your hand I said Jazakallah for buying it every Quran that I'm giving out to people is costing me 15 rands extra I give you the Quran you give me five that means out of 25 I got and I give you 15 with it so what's the purpose what kind of madness is this why must I do that to go to hell no 
I said, you see, I follow the example of our Nabi Karim sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Towards his last days on earth, when he could sit back and relax, the whole of Arabia was at his feet. It was only a question of polishing them up, making them better Muslims. And relax now. Let the Sahaba, let them do the job. Hmm? Not so. Allah Bari Ta'ala sends Akhir Jibreel to him. Towards his last days in Medina. And commands him, tells him, Wama arsalnaka illa kafatal linnasi bashiram wa naziram walakin akthar linnasi la yalamun. So we have not sent you, O Muhammad. But as a giver of glad tidings and as a warner to the whole of mankind. Not only to the Arabs, but to the whole of mankind. But the bulk of mankind, they still do not know. So what does he do? Can he start running in all directions? Has he got this, what is this? This, this tax machines, uh, this TV, you know, BBC, ABC, America, PBS, what? What has he got? Nothing. Nothing. What is he going to do? So what he had, he did. He called the scribes, people who could read and write. So come, come, come. He dictated five letters to the Emperor of Persia, Emperor of Constantinople, the King of Egypt, the King of Yemen, and the Negus of Abyssinia. Five letters on five scrolls. Something like skin, like parchment. He gave one each to one Sahaba with one horse. The Arabian horse, the Mercedes-Benz of the time. BMW of the time. That's an Arabian horse. Invaluable life. One Sahaba. Thousand miles this way. Another one. Fifteen hundred that way. One across the Red Sea. One. Five Sahabas. He risked their lives to just to go and deliver that message. And on that message, there's one in the Topkapi Museum in Turkey. I have seen it with my own eyes. It begins. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. First ayah of the Quran. It begins with the first ayah of the Quran. It says from Muhammad Rasulullah to Heraclius, the Emperor Constantinople, accept Islam and be benefited. Then another ayah from the Quran. Qul ya ahl al-kitab, ta'alaw ila kalimatin sawa'im, baynana wa baynakum, an la na'abuda illa Allah, wa la nushrika bihi shay'an, wa la yattakhiza ba'aduna ba'adan arbaaban min duni Allah, fa in tawallaw fa'kulu shahdu biyanna muslimun. Then he ends in his own words and his seal. Five letters went out like that. Allah's kalam, he is giving it to the non-Muslim. Those people had no taharat whatsoever. They didn't wash the backsides. You know that? Our Nabi didn't say, look, you go and ask the fellow. He said, look, did you have a bath? He said, no, go, no, ghusl and come. No. He said, look, go and give it all respect. This is what our Nabi did. So, if you're giving the Quran, if you're in trouble, you're in good company. If Allah will choke you up, you'll have to choke up his Nabi as well. Because he gave, he set as an example, this is what he did. So this purity, La Yamasuil al Mutaharun, he's on a different level. And you ask the alim, there are alims, they tell you no, you can't give. Because it's Arabic script. That makes it holy. Alright? You can give a translation. The same fellow will tell you you can give translation. It's alright. There are 10 million Coptic Christians in Egypt. Egyptian Christians who speak Arabic as the mother tongue. They are the original people of Egypt. These are converts to Islam. All the Egyptian Muslims, 40 million are converts from Coptic Christianity. You didn't know that? Before Islam reached Egypt, what were they? They were Coptic Christians all. So the majority of them became Muslim and those that remain behind, today there are 10 million. Coptic Christians in Egypt. I am asking this Sheikh, this Alim, ask him, what translation will you give him? Africans? <laughs> Chinese? What translation? Come and tell me now. They are Arabs, man. What translation? He said, no, 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 I can't give you Arabic. I must give you Zulu. <laughs> Does it make sense to you? Lunacy, man, lunacy. Now tell me, I said, look, here, 10 million there. In the Lebanon, there are Arab Christians. There are 15 million Arab Christians in the world. Tell me, what translation will you give them? What translation? Tell me. You, if our Nabi was, they said, no, we can't give him this Arabic Quran, we must have it, you know, somebody translated in Chinese, and then give it to him. Is that what he will do? 
Huh? Look what did he do? He wrote letters in Arabic to people who couldn't read Arabic because he couldn't help it. If he knew Greek, he would have written the first letter in Greek. To the Ethiopian, he would send in the Ethiopian language. To the German, he would send the Germanist language. No. He, what they knew, they knew Arabic, they wrote it in Arabic and they sent somebody hoping somebody will translate it for them. That's what he did. The Arabic Quran verses he sent out. What is good for my Nabi is good enough for me. He set me an example. So if I'm in trouble, I'm in good company. You are also in good company. Yes, my brother. short your question is that since there is a controversy at the moment some Dutch reformed churches they have taken up as an issue in the Transvaal and other places and as you say now here that if there is a halal label on which uh, satisfies us they say look man then we can buy without having to give a second thought if the price is right if the thing that we want is there we buy it because it's halal now they don't want that halal, they want to throw it out. Now how do we respond to that type of thing? Now that to me is the MJC, Muslim Judicial Council, and the Islamic Council of South Africa. These are the brains. They must supply the answers. If, if these, if, you see, if these Christians want to talk to me, so I'm prepared to talk to them. So come, come, man, talk. Where is getting stuck? This halal getting stuck in your throat. Come, talk to me. I can talk to them. But how we are going to solve this problem? They said, look, our leaders, they must tell us what to do. So start slaughtering your own chickens. You know, we have, we have lost the art of slaughtering chickens. I'm sure if I've asked you people in the last 12 months, how many of you slaughtered one chicken? And there won't be one follow. Right, you have lost that. That militance has gone out. Your wife has never done it. Your mother has never done it in her life. Look, we have to train our people also to do their own slaughtering. However, look, I will, that's all philosophy, philosophizing. The thing is, there are real people who can give you a lead. To me, I look up to them. Like in the Natal and the Transvaal. In Natal, my Jamia, the Ulama, at one time they told me the rainbow chicken is halal. I start. I accepted I, that. I was buying it. Then something happened. They said, we don't give any more halal certificate. So, shh, I don't buy any more rainbow chickens. I trust them. Because I know my alims, you can't buy them. You can't bribe them. They can make mistakes. They can make wrong decisions, but you can't buy them. So if my alim, I have trust in them. There are so many other things I fight and argue and debate. Like the Quran issue. I'll argue and debate with them. But halal and haram, shh, no arguments. He tells me rainbow chicken halal, I said right. He said, but you know, how can you slaughter so many hundred thousand in so many hours? How can you do 10 a minute or 20 a minute? I said, look, shh, please, don't burden me. This, the burden is on the heads of our alims. Yes, brother. Yes, you know, I delivered a whole lecture on that. Uh, the gist of it was the psychology of propagation that you speak to a people anybody according to the background and experience if you are a fisherman you are going to catch fish you know what type of fish are you catching 
you know there is a shad there is 74 there is this that you know different fish different type of fish they take different type of baits if you are a fisherman you know so that's a psychology you're using psychology with the fish similar psychology you use with human beings what background the Hindu well you have to talk to him according to his background and experience the Christian according to his background and experience the Jew according to his background and experience and Allah is giving it to us in the Holy Quran he says, anybody comes along with any type of claim you simple basic thing tell him kul hatu burhanakum your proof once you get his proof you know how to deal with it this is the psychology I was trying to explain the tape will be available inshallah shortly because it took more than an hour to expound that yes Especially in the restricting them in the community. Restricting them in the community. No, I do agree with that criticism. We Muslims, to me, we are the most unjust people to our women folk. Look, now I'm going to raise a hornet's nest. It, I can't help it. You see, here I have to take a stand that we have been unjust to our own. We allow them to work in our shops, in our offices, work in factories, our women folk. But we will not allow them in the house of God. When we do, sometimes some great lecturers coming, like Ahmad Didat. So what they do, what they do, they put them behind the wall with a horn. They put them in the basement with a horn. I've seen that. My wife does not attend any of my lectures. For that reason. She's asking me, what's the arrangement? I said, well, there's, there's a horn there for you to listen to us. She wants to see, not because I'm her husband. She said, this is natural. You want, there's eye contact. When you have an eye contact, the message goes in far more easily. Your attention is absorbed. See, what I'm doing? Everything now is holding you. But suppose you're listening to a mic. You know, you'll be looking at a nice chandelier. How did they get that thing there, you know, nice globe there? This is the human mind. You can't help it. So they, always we are complaining, they're making noise. Your women folk making noise. You know the guy shout. Don't make noise. I say, you fool, you are the cause. <laughs> you are the what are you shouting at them? Because now they can't hear properly. They don't know what's going on. So the woman to another, they meet. It's an occasion for them. He says, Your daughter, is she married? He says, No. Is she engaged? Says, no, not yet. She, what else do you expect them to do? Huh? And you're blaming them. I say, look. Be just for a little while. Abdul Abdul Samad Abdul Basit, Qari Abdul Samad Abdul Basit. He's reciting the recital here, and how you know how much we loved it in the city hall in Durban. I know might be here also in Cape Town. Hmm? Now we say now the women folk mustn't be there. Okay, where he said we'll, we'll put them in a, in, a, in an ad adjacent room, right? Then they listen to the horn, right? I said, what about you for a change going and listening to that? Let the ladies sit and see the fellow and listen to him. So, no. Why? Your wife will fall in love with him? Huh? She'll run away with this fellow? Basit? He's got time to come along and you know, play with your wife? Your mother? What's wrong with you? I said, there's something wrong with you, man. No, your wife comes and listens to me and she'll run away with me. There's something wrong with you. <laughs> what has happened now? Give them separate but equal facility. We are not saying, not suggesting that they must stand shoulder to shoulder. Islam forbids that. No free intermingling. But give them separate but equal facility. Create it, man. Today we can create anything that you want. A mezzanine floor. Today, I went and offered one of the masjids in Krasi Park, was it? Yeah. Yes. Lotus River. Huh? Lotus River. Lotus River. New masjid. Beautiful. No, I mean, not as beautiful as this. They're struggling. And I saw that they made some arrangements for ladies with brickwork. That the ladies, they can't see the speaker. I said, look, what you do? You put a glass one way that only the ladies can see the Imam. We don't want the Imam to see them. <laughs> I told them, I said, we don't want the Imam to see them. The poor fellow will be distracted. <laughs> you know, we want to save him. I said, look, let them see. Because if they are watching and listening, 
you are holding their attention. They won't have a tendency to talk with one another. We are not talking. Why aren't you talking? Why aren't you chatting among one another? You know why? Because I am holding you all. You see that every movement I am making is holding you. Am I right? Yes. But if you are listening to a horn, <laughs> La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah Mashallah What is that? Wa aqimu salata, wa atu zakata, wa atu raqin. Ah, this is certainly written in Urdu at the bottom. Hmm. This is the human mind. You can't help it. Wallah, you can't help it. So we have been the most unjust of people to our own. I have to confess. We must do something about it as a create for them opportunities. Because our women folk are our weakest link. Our daughters are running away wholesale with the mushriks. In Natal and the Transvaal, they're running away with the matrasis. Wholesale. And wholesale is a mild term. Why? I said, you don't cater for them. For our own, we don't cater for them. When did your daughter, your sister last hear something about Islam? When? She is now in standard 6, then she goes to high school, she goes to the university. When? At least 52 times a year, your brother is listening to what's going on. Your sister, how many times in her lifetime she heard? So, if they let us down by running away with the mushriks, I said, you are responsible. We haven't catered for them. But in that regard, the Malay, Alhamdulillah, is far better than the Indian Muslim in Natal and the Transvaal. He's far better. See, in the Transvaal, there is a masjid in Azad Will. Beautiful masjid. This is nothing. This masjid is beautiful, but it's nothing compared to the one in Azad Will. It cost them when they built it about quarter million. I think it will be worth about a couple of million today. They have a separate mezzanine floor. That the ladies, separate entrance, separate wudu facility, separate toilet facility, they are in the mosque and yet out of the mosque. No men folk ever rub shoulders with them. But no woman has seen the inside of that place. Because the sheikh, the imam, we call the molvi, the maulana, he says, if any woman goes there, I resign. He'll resign. Sir, it's a white elephant. You know, nobody has seen. He's there. Wallah, is there. Separate facility for wudu, toilet, facility, everything. They are in the masjid, house of Allah, and yet they are out. No free intermingling. That's what Islam says. No free intermingling. It's all there. But no woman has reached that place. So when a man points a finger and says, look, you people are unjust. I can't help it. I have to say. It is true. It's our culture, our background. We inherited this. You know, we brought this from India or wherever we're from. We brought this along with us. And it seems to be taking time. For people to realize that we are unjust to our own. <laughs> then if the other people are unjust to us, what's so, so, so wonderful about that? <laughs> yes, my brothers. <laughs> yes, my brother. What was the question you, you got it? About the reborn fish? Yes. Oh yes. That uh, why, oh, at the meeting. Because at the apostolic surrounding, uh they to a new uh reborn Christian because I used to confront it. Now to come with the reborn. Right. Yes, this is a new sickness. It's, no, I mean you find new ways of dealing with it, you see. He's born again. You see, he's born again. He's a new life. So what do you want to do? You want to share your faith with me? He said, yes. He wants to share his faith with you. That comic strip, Saleh, you haven't got in the car. Is it there? We got some uh, at, at home. At home. I can see it. You think we'll have time enough? For that? Yeah. All right. Let somebody go and get it. All right. Uh, they can pick it that side. Let me show this. Let them pick them up from the shop. Here is an answer to the sickness. This is a comic strip. You know, people love to read comics. When I was young, wallah, I tell you, I was a comic king. <laughs> no, this is... It was some hunger was created in me, read, read, read. And I had just come from India at the age of nine. The easiest thing I could read was the comics. 
So I started reading comics, 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 and from there I graduated to true love and romance, and from there to mystic science. <laughs> now, this is how the mind develops, you see. I developed like that, like anybody else. So now I says, comic, here is a comic strip. An open challenge to you. Do you dare to test the faith of any Christian? Do you? That's not a challenge to you. Do you dare to challenge his faith? And it tells you now, here is a story about Ahmad and John. Ahmad is me, though he doesn't look like me. But, you know, he's got my smile, you can see that. When I was young, you see, perhaps. And this John is a certain John I also have in mind. Right. So a conversation takes place. The guy comes along. He wants to share his faith. So Ahmad is asking him, he says, you have faith? He said, of course. Because you can't share something you haven't got. See, I can share with you my five runs if I got it. If I haven't got anything, how can I share anything with you? Knowledge, if I have, I can share. If I haven't got it, I can't share. So you got faith? He said, yes. So, if you have faith, you have a right to share. If you haven't got it, you have no right to share. Right. So, he says, now let's see now. You see the Holy Bible. Jesus Christ, he says in the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 16, verses... 17 and 18 he says and these signs signs mojizas shall follow them that believe anybody who believes will be able to produce these signs miracles what are these miracles in my name in the name of Jesus shall they cast out devils anybody sick got the possess mind is gone it's gone man Shh. he said he can heal him oh very good in my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They'll speak Indonesian. They'll speak Chinese. Try them out. They'll speak with new tongues. I want to hear. Speak my language, man. Malay. I haven't heard it for a long time. 300 years we haven't heard. Come on, come on. Your Holy Ghost, let's see if he can make you to speak. We want to hear what it sounds like. He shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. Slanga. You know? Snakes. They'll pick it up. Snakes. And if they drink any deadly thing, any poison, it shall not hurt them. Any poison they drink, nothing, no harm. I'm sure you got some poison in the house. Some cockroach killer, hmm? spray, hmm? ant killer, have something. He said, look man, this is what your book says. This is what Jesus said. If you have faith, you should be able to do all that. Come on, I want to test you. Before you give me what you got, I want to know whether you got it, that faith. And you see how he runs like a dog. You know, beaten dog with a tail between his legs. He'll never darken your door again. This you owe it to yourself in absolutely free. Go and pick it up from Ross Smith supermarket. When you're passing, you don't have to buy anything to get this. And the other booklets, you don't have to buy anything to get them. Wallah. If they make it a condition, you telephone me. I'll fly down. I want to put the, my brother right. No, this is free. But you, my brother, you won't do homework. They don't even have to go inside the shop, it's outside. It's outside. But you, my brothers, you see, you all here are here to be entertained. You are here, I'm telling you, you are all here to be entertained. And I'm entertaining you. You don't mean business, Wallah, you don't mean business. If you mean business, it's a, here is a weapon I'm giving you. Every lecture I'm giving you a weapon. Go along, use this, master this. You want to do karate? You have to go through the same exercise, hundred times over. You know that? I did boxing, same, straight left, straight left, how many times? So it becomes a reflex action without you thinking, without thinking. If the guy, now it has come to a position that I, either he gives it to me, I give it to him, I give it to him first. No, it's a reflex action. I don't have to think where it reaches nose or not. I know it must reach, if it goes straight, it must reach his nose. That's how you are trained. This, I'm giving you the weapon, but I know, I don't know why am I speaking to you all. Nobody wants to do anything. You all want that pill. Swallow one pill and you become a superman. It doesn't work that way, Wallah, it doesn't work that way. You want to become a heavyweight champion, boxer, you have to work and work. Weightlifter, work, work, work. Swimmer, wait, work, work, work. You know that? There's nothing you get for nothing in life. All this is what I'm doing. I'm paying a price, Wallah, I'm paying a price. Look, I have to write that ayah. I have to write that ayah, I have to learn, memorize, come along and stand and speak before you. I have to pay a price. Everybody has to pay a price. You don't want to pay any price. You just want to hear, yes, very good. Mm -hmm. Yes, you know, yes, I think it can be done. But 
you are not prepared to do <coughs> exert a bit of energy you are not prepared to burn your energy mm -hmm. so we will ever remain as punching bags for people they come and practice on us punching bags doormats people are using us like doormats the Christian he's doing it to you he's coming and knocking and he's terrifying you because if that guy comes to your house three times and if you haven't changed him he has changed you you're not Christianized but your morale is broken finish you're not the same anymore you're a cracked egg if that man came to your house three times and you didn't change him he's changed you in your determination in your spirit you are gone no man you can remain a Muslim for a thousand years after that but you are a cracked egg cracked Muslim that's what you are no when the guy comes along it's a God sent opportunity for you to knock hells into him and bowl him over then before he when he comes take his name and address his telephone number you might have won that debate and you are satisfied no you don't remain satisfied he won't come back he'll promise he'll come back he'll never come back you go to his house you terrify him out of his wits keep on visiting him until he is converted or he says look don't darken my door next time you come I'll put a knife through you then you say Waiza humul jahiluna qalu salama. then you say peace okay until then either you go or he goes this is the Muslims life but we all like to be entertained you want to be entertained by Uncle Dida. That's why you come to listen to me, see how my beard, beard moves, and, you know, how he talks, how he acts. Yeah. That's what you come for. My wish is that this may be an excuse for you to get started, do something. And the material is available, free of charge. I don't want you to become my murid, my disciples. Well, I don't want anything. What do I want from you? Want to do business with you? It's a total loss for every one Quran you buy. I'm losing 15 runs. When you buy one, I'm losing 15 runs. What business I want to do with you? We can change this country. We can topsy turvy this country. You know that? Without shedding of blood, without killing anybody, it can be done. That's the destiny Allah is offering it to us. He said, "Li yuzahira hu alad dine kulle." He's given you a deen. That's to master, overcome, and supersede them all bulldoze them all walau kariha al-mushrikoon now mind how my the mushrik might not, might not like it this is the destiny of his deen and he repeats it again another place in the Quran same formula then he repeats again huwa allazi arsala rasulahu bil huda he it is who has sent his messenger with guidance wa deen al-haq and with the religion of truth li yuzhira huwa ala deen kulli that it may prevail overcome and supersede every other deen whether it be Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianism, Communism, Judaism, every ism, Islam is destined to master them all. Wakafa billahi shahida. And enough is Allah is a witness to this fact that He's going to make His deen to prevail with you or without you. I'm asking, you believe that? Do you believe it? That this is the destiny of His deen? Allah says, Do you believe in it? Huh? I want to hear, let these people record it. Yes. yes. That's what the Arabs say. I've been talking to them. I say, you believe it? You say, yes. I say, loudly. You say, yes. I say, is that why you sit on your backside doing nothing? Hmm? If you believe, you got the laser gun, what do you do? You wait. They're killing our children. You're going to sit and wait here? You're going to make dua? Dua? <laughs> no, you'll run, man. You say, I got the laser gun. We make dua because we have no alternative. We pray to Allah for help. But if you had the laser gun, you can blast them out of this world, what would you do? Won't you go? We haven't got it, so we say we make dua, may Allah accept it. This is the reason. But if you believe, you go for it. You don't sit on your backside reading the Subhi, Subhanallah, Subhanallah, that won't help you. You have to arm yourself. Go out, change the world. Jamaat, we've had a pleasant but a long evening, but it's the end of the 1989 tour of the Cape. I ask of you a few minutes more. While the people were questioning and while Uncle Ahmad was speaking, I'd just like to reply to somebody about the question of the Dutch Reform Minister and arguing and about the halal stamp. On the, on the tins 
on the food. The Christian who brings that to you say that's not a problem. In this morning Sunday times, the same Dutch Reformed people have put a stamp elsewhere. They've put a stamp on their church, it must remain white. Check this morning's paper. So they're worried about the tin food, their place of prayers is not open to all races. Then somebody raised the question which is currently burning Cape Town to pieces. I only have an appeal to make. That appeal is, at this point in time, regardless of what the outcome is going to be on the 13th and the 14th, my appeal is, please let us respect the dignity and the sacredness of the unity of the Ummah. That is important. The other evening, uh, a Christian missionary came up to the platform, very well spoken, very well trained, psychology, everything. And you know, he reached the point where I thought, this is it. He said, I challenge you, Mr. Dirat, and I thought, this is it. Because Brother Ahmad Dirat has extended the challenge to the Pope already. He has met personally with Jimmy Swaggart. Also to Billy Graham. There was no response to it. But I thought he was going to challenge him. I challenge you to a debate. I challenge you to meet Billy Graham. He said, I challenge you to listen to Billy Graham. This I also would like to share with you in the debate with Jimmy Swaggart if you practice you with that paper and practice on the first person you will make your mistakes but by the time you come to the tenth person you already know how to use that pamphlet and your mind is going elsewhere and then you also will get training your mind I watched that tape Didat versus Swaggart or Swaggart versus Didat and they in my opinion, when I was watching the tape, I thought, Swaggart has got Didat now. He said, Mr. Didat, we have invited you to our Christian nation to debate the topic, Is the Bible the Word of God? Will you now show the courage to invite Reverend Swaggart to debate you once again on the same topic in the city of Mecca? And if not, why? Mecca. You see, if the questioner had asked, are you prepared to debate Brother Swaggart in the United States in the different cities? I said, I'm prepared now to offer $10,000 for each meeting in places like the Madison Square Garden in New York. Venues of that kind, $10,000 per meeting, four meetings in the United States, $40,000. But the questioner is asking, whether I would be prepared to invite him to Mecca. Now, I don't rule Mecca, number one. Number two, if you want to get into Mecca, you need a visa. When I had to come to the United States, your government forced me to get a visa. And I went through the process of acquiring that visa, and I'm here. You see, I wanted to get, go to the old Zambia. You know, when Zambia became independent, I wanted to go to Zambia. At that time, Smith was ruling this south, southern Rhodesia. So they gave me visa forms. And I had to sign at the back that I do not recognize the illegitimate Smith regime before they'll give me a visa. I had to, I wanted to go. So I had to sign the document that I do not recognize the illegitimate Smith regime in southern Rhodesia. Say, similarly, if I have to come to the United States, I, feel, I fulfill your terms and conditions. Whatever you tell me, if I'm prepared to go through with it, I get the visa. Without that, no visa in Canada, no visa here, no visa for people in South Africa. You have to fulfill the conditions. Now, there is a condition attached to you visiting Mecca. And that condition is that you declare with your lips, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. The meaning is, the meaning is that I believe that there is but one God, not Father, Son and Holy Ghost, not Jesus that God. I believe in the one and only God, Allah, which is his name. And that Muhammad is the last and final messenger of God. 
you feel that condition, you are welcome to come to Mecca. Then there are people who are probably going to say, uh, as the question came very innocently tonight, how do I give the Quran to a person who is a non-Muslim? There are similar people going to say, people going to say, how can you advertise the reading of the Quran on Mnet? Now those of you who have heard the other lectures, there is an advert coming which Uncle Ahmad Lira has arranged, but he's got to do it because we don't do it. You see. We don't advertise the Quran, we don't live the lifestyle of the Quran, and we are too scared to take the Quran to a friend and say, read it with me or I give you a copy. So he's got to advertise it and to make the advertisement cost him 27,000 rands. To screen it for 30 seconds is 6,000 rands. So to run it for the week is 30,000 rands. To advertise that. Again because you and I, we don't do it. So when people criticize, it is easy if you're sitting on that side of the line. We would like to end this evening by saying, I have no fear that when Brother Ahmad Didat goes, that the job in America will not be done. We have seen our brother is hot tonight. Sir, may Allah bless you, inshallah. And many thanks for sharing your feelings and your thoughts with us. We say shukran, not only for being here tonight, but also to being in the Cape, Brother Ahmad Didat. May Allah be with you, inshallah. But I trust that amongst us will be born so many Didas to carry the job at a time when the missiles are coming faster. Please be present at the Good Hope Center tomorrow evening at 7.30. Please bring your friends. I do not see the Imam here. Imam? He left already. Brother Hassan, please come and give us a Fatiha closing door. Hassan Walili. اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وأصحابه وبارك وسلم آمين آمين ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار آمين ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت مهاب ربنا اغفر لنا ولإخواننا الذين سبقونا بالإيمان ولا تجعل في قلوبنا غلا للذين آمنوا ربنا إنك رؤوف رحيم اللهم أعطنا إيمانا كاملا وأمانا دائما ورزقا واسعا وقلا تاما وعلما نافعا وعلا صالحا وحكا حسنا اللهم أعطنا عزة وصحة وراحة وفرحة وقوة لعبادتك وعطنا معرفتك يا الله بحرمة القرآن العظيم والنبي الكريم على آله وأصحابه أجمعين اللهم اكتب السلامة والصحة والعافية علينا ولعبيدك الحجاج والغزاة والمسافرين والمرابطين والمقيمين والحاضرين والغائبين آمين آمين في برك وبحرك من أمة محمد صلى الله, الله تعالى وسلم عليه وسلم يا رب نادرين ومتمتعين آمين آمين قال الله تعالى في شأن حبيبه إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي آمين آمين يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك اللهم افتحنا بالخير واختم لنا بالخير واجعل عواقب امورنا بالخير امين امين بيدك الخير انك على كل شيء قدير الا ان اولياء الله لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون الذين امنوا وكانوا يتقون سبحان ربك رب العزه عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين ما شاء الله